I should have done the record. There we go. Okay, the recording started. Okay, so hello, my name is Tomáš Miller. I'm a member of the Unitime team. I, I have done most of the work on the on the solver and a lot of the work on, on the user interface. And today we are going to talk about student scheduling in Unitime. So I have just one slide, a brief introduction to Unitime here. So. It is a comprehensive academic solution. It's not just student scheduling. It contains course timetabling, examination timetabling, student scheduling, and event management. It's open source. It's completely web-based. It's written, written in Java using modern technologies like Google Web Toolkit and Spring and Hibernate. It's a state-of-the-art optimization algorithm for building the timetables. The data entry and the timetabling as well could be distributed or done centrally or either way, like you can have the data entry distributed and then timetable everything by, by the central office. Multiple users can use unit time. We have various roles from administrators all the way to students. And well, it will be almost two years since we, well, a year and a half since we joined the Apparel Foundation. So what's scheduling? Scheduling is an enrollment of students into classes in a way that the students can maximize, uh, that we maximize the, the ability for the students to, that, to, to get the courses they need or, or desire. So essentially the, the basic idea is that the students tell us what courses they need and we, we put them into classes so that they don't block each other that uh, their free time requirements are respected and, and vice versa. I will get into more details later. Why this is needed? This is mostly to, to ensure that the students get the courses they need in an environment where a lot of courses are offered with, with multiple sections, multiple labs, parallel pa uh, lectures, uh, and so on. We also want to prevent students that come early in, in, into the system to block students that come later. So we have done a lot of work in, in that regard as well. And also getting a workable schedule for a student can be a tedious process. So this the unit time can, can help with that as well. So essentially, as, as I already mentioned, the goal is that the students fill in course requests, alternatives, free times, and the student then, then the system provides them with, with a schedule that meets their needs and they have the ability to, to modify that schedule as they wish. Here is a slide describing a bit more about, about the need. So essentially trying to explain why there could be time conflicts or section limit conflicts. So a student may not be able to take a combination of courses because they are just overlapping in time. For instance, here if, if a student is biology and chemistry, because of the lectures are in overlapping time, the student cannot cannot take cannot take both. Or if, for instance, if, if a student wants needs a combination of these and some of the sections are already blocked, like imagine that the mathematics, there are two choices. You can a student can take either lecture A or lecture B, but if if, if that student also needs statistics, that forces that student into lecture A, and if the lecture A is not available. Then, despite the fact that there are still some space in the other lecture, that student cannot take the, the combination of courses he or she needs. And I have that a little bit demonstrated on the next slide. Where, yeah, you can see as, as the classes become full, there are less options, and some options may prevent students, or some availability, unavailabilities may prevent students to get the, the courses they, they, they truly need. In Unitime, we do student scheduling on various levels. The first one is there is some student scheduling in the course timetabling already. So at the time that the course timetable is being built, besides of other criteria like preferences of times for rooms, for distribution preferences, we also do minimize the number of student conflicts because yeah, it's, it's important. If the course timetable is bad, no, 
<laughs> you cannot do much with student scheduling. If, if two mandatory courses have the lecture at the same time, yeah, no students will be able to take both. What's, what's important here, we can take the demand of students from various sources. What's usually like, if, 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 if an institution doesn't have anything else, they have the last like student course enrollments. Essentially, they just take, okay, last year students did take these courses and we can just take that information. We can also work from curriculum information. So we can know that database, uh, computer science students with database major will take this list of courses in the, their second year of, of study and these are the mandatory courses, these are the electives and these are the optionals. Or we can take a combination of these. So we can, for instance, that it's quite common actually is that we use curricula for mandatory and elective courses and we use last like or the historic enrollments to fill in the, the optional courses and also the percentages so we know that for instance, okay, they need to take foreign language, but based on the historic data, half of the students will take English, a third will take, take French, and German will take the rest. So we don't we, we have information also on how many spaces we'll need in each of the courses from each of the curricula. The other option is course requests, where the students actually do fill in pre-registration before the timetabling is done so that we can take into account the actual student demand for that particular session. Or again, we can take a combination. For instance, at the time the timetabling is done, usually for fall, the fresh, uh, freshman students are still not, not around. So yeah, we need to take the, for instance, curriculum data or the, the historic data for, for those, or not, not all the students will fill in the pre-registration. So the output of this step is course timetable that's done in a way that uh, minimizes student conflict. So there is, a, 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 if, if nothing else, a high chance that the student scheduling will work as well. So in the next step, when we have a course timetable built, we can take student pre-registration or student course requests as we call them and create student schedules. In this step, the outcome of this step is that every student get Quote preliminary preliminary schedule based on what, what modules are used. It's also possible that only the batch scheduling is used, and at the end, every one gets a schedule, and that's it. It is an optimization process. Uh, that's the reason why it's called batch. It's it's like with course timetabling. You load the data into the solver, you run the solver, and after half an hour, you get a schedule of all the students. So every student has, has a schedule and it works with all of them in a way that it maximizes the, the, the students the ability to get into the courses. It's possible to iterate. So if you see, okay, the schedules are not looking good because there is not enough space in a particular course, you can go back to the course timetabling at a section of the course and run the batch scheduling again, or we can even do stuff like we, we batch schedule the some some group of students before some uh, some other group of students so yeah there are some choices there and the, the the last module is the online student scheduling at that point there is still solver but it does not do do a batch essentially every student comes as, as the students come in they, they give us their their requirements they get immediately a schedule and have the ability to immediately enroll into the courses they need or if they already have a schedule, they can come in at a course or make some other modifications and make the changes in their schedule. What's important in this step, because we still want to make sure that the students that did not register yet will be able to, to get the courses that they need. We can automatically kind of reserve space in sections that we know will be needed. And actually that's something I have not mentioned on the previous guide. B besides of the course requests, we also can take consider projections. Essentially, again, based on the historic data or curricula, we can fill in the the remain the the remaining students that did not register yet with with these, so that for the online scheduling, we know where the spaces for those students that did not come yet will be needed. So that's. That's our expectations. 
and even here student get a schedule but they can still use the solver to pro to get suggestions so essentially okay i don't like this 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 course or this enrollment they can just click on a class and they get alternatives ordered by the quality they can filter through and i will show a bit of that during the during the demo at the end of the presentation so here is a slide this is essentially the information we we need from the students before they we can give them a schedule and this can either be there is a similar page just to collect the course request or this is a screenshot of the page when we are actually on the in the online phase so after they fill in the list of courses they immediately get a schedule and, and can enroll at the moment essentially each line means one one course request one course they they want to get or a free time requirement there could be alternatives for instance here the student wants english uh, chemistry 115 or if there is no space or it does not replace other courses he has or she has he can get chemistry 111 instead or we can also have the alternative course requests that are there to fill in the, the desired number of courses so a student may want five courses and for reason if, we, if, if that student cannot get biology or, or history we will get he, he can get the design instead the other thing that's in here is the ability to wait lists, which actually I'm with that I'm saying, okay, if I cannot get into English 106, I want to get on the wait list. I don't want an alternative course. I just, yeah, I, I will wait. And there is a automated processing of this wait list. So the minute there is space and I get on top of the wait list, I'll, I'll get into the course. There is just a, a close up on, on that screenshot. So yeah, you can see it's essentially for each line there is a request and there could be alternatives and there are these alternative course requests where I need to get the desired number of, of courses. The, the next, the, the other item that comes in place are the courses. So a course, it's not just a list of classes for us. We have a structure which which is very well defined. For those of you that have been using course timetabling before, that's mostly used or the, the primary purpose of the structure was originally for the course timetabling, but it also is very nice because it gives us a clear way of how to see how students can get into the course. So for instance, here is a a portion of the previous screenshot where I can see, okay, there is a course that's being offered under two different names. It's either Mathematics 170 or Statistics 170. And it has one, it has two configurations. It can have a traditional configuration, for instance, is here and an online learning. So if a student is, is getting into the course, he, they, they may choose or the system may choose for them whether they get online configuration or the traditional. And within the configuration, each a student needs to take a class of every subpart. So in, every student needs to have a lecture and a lab and a recitation in, in this particular case. And the, the, the next thing here, it defines the structure, it defines what the relation. So if, if a student is taking lab one or lab two, that student also need to take lecture one or with lecture two, I need to take lab, lab three or lab, lab four. So essentially at the end, this is the list of, of combinations that I can take. So this is the way I, I, I can enroll into the course. And yeah, besides of that, uh, there are other constraints and reservations and I'll, I'll get to them in a bit. So the first, and I've already talked a, a little bit about it, first constraint that, that we do have are, are time conflicts. During the student scheduling, we are not allowing students to get into classes that are conflicting with each other. There are exceptions, however. Some course, some portions of a course may be marked as that they allow overlaps. For instance, at some institutions, lectures are not mandatory, so we do allow for, we, we, they may allow students to to get to conflicting lectures in that case we try to minimize the overlap so if it's possible the student does not get get two lectures that are overlapping but 
it does not prevent them to get two courses. Just we can allow certain combinations of, of classes. There is an, an ignore student constraint or distribution preference that could be used. And as a last resort, we also have individual reservations, which is a way how we can essentially give a student an exception to, to be able to get into a, a class or a, or a course that's overlapping with something else that the student needs. What's also important to realize, especially during the online student scheduling, if a class moves in time, that also, also means that these time conflicts needs to be evaluated and it's possible that some students may need to get automatically be reassigned to some other section or put in on a wait list because they no longer can attend the course. The other constraint are the limits. Every class, every section may have a limit. There could be a limit on each configuration. And if there are reservations, each reservation may have a limit. We can we have also a special type of a limit. We can disable a section for student scheduling, which acts like that class doesn't have a does not have a limit. Does as a class has a zero limit. This is sometimes useful if you want to timetable a course with some extra labs in advance, but you don't want to let students in until you know that the student that the course is failing enough so that it makes sense to, to open all, all, all the labs. So you can just mark some of them as, as disabled for student scheduling, which means students will not be able to get in there. Or it's it's also sometimes used to for courses that are restricted to a very limited number of students, in which case the department may choose that, okay, I only allow students for which we, we do provide individual reservations. In that case, yeah, the classes have, have zero limit. They, they are disabled for student scheduling, so only students with an individual reservation can, can get in. What's also important to realize, during the especially during the online scheduling, if I decrease the limit, but the students are already in, the system will not automatically bump those students out. For the time conflict, that it, it will, but not for, for the limit. So, and it's, it's, it's the same with reservations. If, if the students are already in, I would have to make a, do, do a manual actions with them because the system will not bump them out automatically. Unless, for instance, in his, in this particular, if I cancel a class, if, if a class is canceled, then those those students must take some or something else, and the system will automatically put them into some other sections if, if there is one that's available to them. Next uh, portion of the data that is needed or that could be useful for for student scheduling are as the reservations. The reservations are essentially a way how you can restrict a certain portion of a course to a certain group of students. So this could be individual reservations for that's just for a list or, or an individual student. There could be student groups defined, which can have in, uh, reservations. We can have reservations based on curriculum. So you can allow only engineers or you can only allow computer science students that are studying databases as their major into a course or into a particular section of a course or there could be course reservations. This is for the courses that are offered under different names. You, you can say, okay, this course is being offered as, or the course has, has two versions, one for all the students and as a version for honorary students, in which case you move it, automatically assign honorary students into a particular lab. So you can have a, a reservation for, for the honorary version of the course that reserve that space in, in that particular lab for those students so that students will automatically flow in there. The reservations can have a limit or they can be marked as unlimited and they, they may have a deadline. Essentially what it means that after the deadline, the reservation is still in the system, but it no longer restricts other students from being able to get into to that section or, or configuration or, or the, the course depending on, on the level of, of restrictiveness of, of the reservation. Additional properties, the reservations may have priority. This is essentially means that if there is multiple 
simple ways how a student can get into a course like if 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 is the, there is an individual reservation for a for a for for that student and there is also a curriculum reservation that is less restrictive it will use the the more restrictive reservation if, if it can and in for some particular reservations it must use them if there are so if if there is an individual reservation because there is a, a particular space in some section block for that particular student that student has to take that reservation that's the only way he can get into the course and this is of course configurable so every every reservation may may or may or may, may not every type of a reservation may or may not have that, that property the other similar property that by default is only set on individual reservation is that individual reservation allow to sign up over the, the section limit or configuration or or configuration limit or that allow a time conflict. So as I said earlier, we can use individual reservations as form of exception. So if there and there often are students that are allowed to to break some some rule like a time conflict or a limit of a sections, we have a way through these individual reservations. And on a course, there is also a toggle saying whether the course requires reservations, in which case every student must have a reservation, even if there is some space that is not reserved right now. So at the end, with all these data in, the student gets, gets a schedule based on their course and free time requirements. We want to give a, each student a schedule that's as, as full, as, as complete as possible to find a, an enrollment into every, require, in, in the, to every course request. The priority is that they're more, the, the biggest reason why we do have them is that that's a way for us to resolve conflicts. So essentially, if, if you recall in my previous slide, over here, yeah, each, each course, there are the lines are numbered. Uh, you have a first priority course, second priority course, and so on. That's that's for also for the solver. So if, if there are two courses and a student can get get uh, and a student can only take one of them because, for instance, they are they have the lecture at the same time, the student will get the course which is a, on, of a higher priority on on the list. So it's it's for us a way how to resolve these these conflicts. If there is a time conflict, you know that the one that the course that's that's higher in the list is the one that the student needs more, and that's the one that the system should should give him or her. And if there are time conflicts allowed for some reason for or some some sections, or we we want to minimize the overlapping time. So if there is a chance not to overlap or find a section that only overlaps with by half an hour, not not as well, then it will try to do that. We also minimize distance student con distance conflicts. This is essentially if there are two classes, two sections that are in different locations that are too far. So the time between is, is, is smaller than the amount of time needed to, to travel from one to the other. That's that's a distance conflict. We do allow them, but they they are minimized. There are some additional criteria as well. We want to avoid, avoid over expected classes. That these are the classes that the system predicts will be needed by students that are not yet in the system based on the last like or curriculum information that it's it's essentially based on the run of the batch solver. And these over expectations, these, these expectations are updated as the students are using the online scheduling. If a student is, is gets in to make a change, we want to keep the previous schedule as much as possible. We want to balance sections so they, as the students come in, especially if we don't know, don't have any expectations because the course is new or for instance, we just want to keep the sections balanced, which gives more chance for the students that come later in the process to, to be able to, to enroll. If there is a chance, we want to give a student a class that has a time rather than the one that's arranged hours. This is mostly because this, it's, it's easier for students to, to get an arranged hour class later than, than the other way around because they, they, they may get some, some, other, some other class at an overlapping time. And for the batch scheduling, there is also the option to keep students of the same student group together as much as possible. 
I've already talked a little bit about expectations. These are computed during batch scheduling based on the projected demands. They help us to fill in the remaining space in a way that uh, it's in sections that are more likely to be needed by students that are yet to come or to create combinations of, of the, these classes that will be needed. And we also use this track, uh, update these expectations during the online scheduling as the student comes. They are, in, in essence, pretty much like reservations, except they are fully automatic. You can see, like, what for only each class, you can see, okay, the limit is 20, the number of enrolled students is five, and we are expecting another five students to come. So there is another 10, 10 students. 10 spaces that are free and any, anyone can get in. A typical example, I already mentioned that first year students are not around for the batch, are usually not around for a batch run, so that yeah, we can take some predictions, historic data or curricula instead and make sure that for courses that are, especially for courses that are needed or that are taken by second year as well, that those don't block the first year students or even the first year students among each other. And at the end, in the online scheduling, we want to minimize cases where the student gets into a class that's over expected in a sense that the current enrollment plus the spaces that the system expects will be needed later is, is over the limit of, of the class. The other feature that's in there, it's it's automated waitlisting. So there are two ways how a, how a student can get on a waitlist. First, they can waitlist themselves if, if they are not able to get into the course. And the other case is that we have to drop the student from the course because of a course change. For instance, if a, a class is, is, is canceled, one of the sections is canceled and the student is uh, not available during the, the other section or the other sections or the sections are already full, filled up, the students is on a wait list. And there can also be deadlines to, to wait lists. So that, yeah, we can, at, at some point, yeah, we can stop doing the wait listing, for instance. And the waitlist, it's uh, there, there is some order in which the students are processed, but it's not just it, the timestamp. We also consider the, the, the priority of the reservation. So like students with individual reservations or with curriculum reservations have priority against students that they don't have any reservations. Or we can also consider the reason for getting on the list. Usually if a student was already in a course, but has got bumped from the course because of a course change, those students got get uh, on top of the waitlist usually. What's important here, we do not make any modif any other modifications to student schedule when they are on a waitlist. So if a student is waitlist for a course and has already some other sections, some other classes enrolled, and if some sections opens, which is overlapping with something else that the student is, is having, we are not giving that student that section because he, he, he does have a conflict. You don't make changes to, to the other classes that the student is, is, is having already. The, the next, uh, the other fun feature is course management during online scheduling. Essentially, during even during online scheduling, there could be changes done to courses. Classes can get canceled. New sections can be added. Classes can be enlarged, move in time, whatever, anything is possible essentially. So how it works in, in any time, you essentially look, log the course, make all the modifications that are needed. So if you need to do two steps, like cancel a class and create another one someplace else, or even restructure the course completely, you can do that. And the minute you unlock the course, it will recheck the existing students if they can stay in the course and if they or whether they have a change. So it's it's possible that a student can still in stay stay in the course, but because the, the section got, got shifted by an hour, the student will just get modified, will get notified that there has been a change in, in his schedule, but he stay as, as as he or she is. 
all the students will, will essentially get dumped from the course, they'll get moved on a wait, uh, put on a wait list at the top of the wait list, and at the end the wait list is processed. So the student will get back to the course, but it will try to to give the student some some placement which is as close as possible to the times that he or she had before. So, for instance, if there were there have been two labs at the same time and one of them has been cancelled, the students will likely get to the other lab at the same time if there is space. And what's also important, the class assignment page that can be used to move move classes will will show will, will tell you at, for each time how many student conflicts it, it will create. So how many students will need to be moved away or may end up on a wait list. There could be also deadlines. They are based on the, the start of the class. So if the class starts in the middle of the term, the deadline is sometime in the middle of the term, it's a number of weeks from the, the, the first meeting of, of the class. There are defaults on the academic sessions and these can be overridden on, on a course. We have some distribution constraints. I've already talked a little bit about the ignore student conflicts. Essentially, another way how we can say, okay, these, these two classes, they are at the same time, but we don't care. Could be because they are two courses that are sharing a lecture, so the students taking both courses are allowed to do that. So we just say, okay, ignore student conflict between these two lectures because they are essentially the same, or the students are taking the same material, even if it's in different place. The other one is, is linked sections, which is neat if you need to kind of link two courses together. So a student taking first lab in this course will take first lab in the other course, Second lab, second lab. So, so they don't, they they are like linked together as, as needed. Whenever there is a change to in in student schedule, or either done by himself or the system or the admin or the schedule managers, there there is a notification email sent to the student. We also have the ability to provide consent, so we can mark a course as a consent, either by of department or instructor, this essentially means who is approving the students. It could be either the instructor, which is the professor teaching the lecture or the course coordinator, Mark as course coordinator, or it could be the schedule manager, the departmental manager dealing, dealing with that. Our, our policy here is that we, the unit time lets the student in, they take the space and they can either get approved and stay in the course or they get rejected and the space is free for another student to come. If there is a need to do the other way around, you need to get an approval before getting in a student, you can do that with having zero limit that disabled for student scheduling section and this individual reservations, you can just put students in. We have the scheduling dashboard that can be used to, to monitor uh, uh, how well how the students are, are coming in, how they are filling up the sections. There is an extensive logging. You can drill down up to a single student and see what he was doing with the scheduling assistant, how he was getting in. And we have a, a number of reports that can be really useful to see if, if especially if there is a problem, if the students cannot getting can get into a particular combination of a course and they are remaining on a wait list or they just have the request you can you can see it there you can see how well the classes are balanced and and so on and there are even more features there are different roles for departmental managers for instructors for advisors so for instance instructors may be allowed to see their court, their classes, they can give a, uh, consent or just see the list of students that are enrolled in their classes and they may take actions based on that if they see, okay, registration just started and I have already the section, all the sections filled, things like that. We have, it's the student can have a status defining whether they can get in or not, whether they need that they can use waitlisting and, and so on. We have the ability to mass cancel a given list of students. There is a number of interfaces that can be ex extended so that we can customize, we can check the eligibility, check the enrollment against some external system at Purdue Views, Elysian, Elysian Banner. 
for that we can uh, retrieve degree plans if, if there there is one from Illusion Degree Works or from some other system. If, if there is an interface implemented, the email template can be changed. There can be an interface to retrieve course details and so on. And I've already mentioned the ability to run Bates Solder on a subset of students. I'll talk a little bit about the state of, of Unitime at Purdue University, where the Unitime is, is being primarily developed. So here we use batch scheduling and online scheduling. The batch scheduling at the moment is only used for a few groups of students. So essentially most of the students, when they when the registration open, they don't have any schedule. They come in and, and use the scheduling assistant to get the courses they need. At the moment, they can choose whether they use unit time or they, they, they use banner interface to, to, to enroll. I think last time it was like half of the students used unit time and half of them used banner. The, the drawback of this approach is that we cannot turn on the wait automated waitlisting on expectations because yeah, if unit time don't allow the student to get into a particular section, they can use banner and, and go around it. Restriction. On the other hand, what's poor, what you're currently doing, students have time windows and there are limits manually updated on classes. So they essentially, for, for some of the courses, they start with zero limits and keep on increasing them as the students come so that they enforce the, the balancing and, and so on. But fortunately, it seems that we are going to, to improve on that. The current vision is to, that we will get, every student will get a, a an initial and preliminary course schedule based on their degree plans. And then they can just get in and they all have a schedule. We are already have given them the courses that they, they indicate they need through their degree planning. Oh, I also did not mention that we use Banner XE student API to synchronize the changes to, to Banner. Essentially, Unitime, we don't do any eligibility checking. That's on the external system on banner to check the prerequisites, corequisites, things like that. Or, and based on the information, the unit time takes actions, keeps the students in or, or rejects the enrollment. And we have recently started working using deg banner degree works to integrate with the degree tool. So through there we can get the, the degree plans of, of individual students. I have here a slide also on new functionality that's being implemented in the new new version of unit time. That's unit time for two that will be released early to, to middle next year. One thing I've been working on is the responsive design. Essentially, the idea what we are or the current approach we are taking is keeping the pages as much as they are they, they look now with all the functionality remaining, but they are more responsive. They, they, they look nicer and are more usable on devices that have smaller width. So the pages, everything, if, if you shrink the page, it, it still shows all the information. You don't, do not have to scroll horizontally or except of, of some of the tables. So here is a screenshot, how it looks on a page, uh, on a device that has a that yeah, has a smaller width. We also have read now the ability to provide more than two alternatives and we no longer show like one course and two alternatives on every line. Rather than that, there is a plus button you can press and provide an alternative and another plus that you can essentially just keep on adding alternatives to your course. What's also new is that you have the preferences the, 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 the student can indicate whether they need what mode of instructions of the course they need, whether they need online. At, at Purdue, we have the traditional, we have online, and we have hybrid. It essentially means that they, they get, everyone gets a lecture, but they don't come in for labs. They do something online with the TAs or with the professor. And the students can indicate when they are filling the request, okay, I need an online version of this course or they can even indicate what section. So I need this lecture, I want this, well, not need, I want this lecture or, or, or that lab. 
and the system it's 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 a preference if possible the student the the system will get them a scheduled meeting their preferences but if the section is, is not available maybe because there is a conflict with something else the student needs or because the space there is no longer enough space or the space is reserved for some other group of students yeah the student gets still gets the course but may not get the the, the section or the mode of instruction they they prefer what I'm also at the moment working on is the ability to, for the students that are also PAs that are also teaching some some labs to automatically avoid these these classes when they are scheduling themselves and actually see them in the scheduling assistant. So if I'm a, a TA, I'm teaching at sometimes I, I'll not I will not get a schedule from from UTI for my for my classes that are overlapping with with my teaching duties. And there will be a few more coming in as well. Maybe at this time I could ask if there are any questions. I'll have a short demo prefer, pre prepared, but it's truly it depends what, what you want to see and how much time I we, we want to spend on that. So I don't see anything in the public chat. Okay, so let's let's go with the demo. So I need to turn on screen sharing. It's a little clumsy. It needs me to download the file, which I need to execute afterwards, which starts some Java process. And of course, my Mac is complaining that the file is not from an approved developer or something. OK, it's starting now. So you should see my desktop um, with a unit time window on it. Yeah, we see uh, now. Okay, good. So I think that which looks the most the nicest or which like running the base solver, it, it does not really show much. You just load the data in, hit the start button, can look at some reports and, and save it afterwards. So I open I, I'll show a few pieces from the online scheduling that's I think more more interesting so let me just pick up a student so I already have the academic session in a state when the online scheduling is enabled so the students can come in and make modifications to their current schedule or if they did not register yet they can come in and, and do the whole process, provide the courses they need. So they can either just start typing in the courses, either just a text, or they can hit the magnify, magnify icon and they get a list with some additional details about the course and the list of classes that they are offered. They can search by, by the course name or, or title. So if I put in like drawing, I can get courses that have a drawing in, in the title. And I can get more information about them. 
I can also put in some free time requirements, either through the course finder where I can select some times. So let's say I want to be free time through 7.30 or 8.30. The other option, if the if unit time is, is connected with a degree planning tool, if a student has a degree plan, you can just hit this degree plan button. This will actually do an API call to the other system and retrieve a degree plan, which may not necessarily need to be just a list of courses. It could be more complicated. For instance, here I can see that there is a number of choices I can make. It could even those choices could be more complicated. There could be like ends inside of of or so I can get either two courses or these two courses or those two courses. You know, just nest those and as we are using uh, degree works, it has the ability if, if if the student has a plan with some choices, they have an ability to select a choice in there. In which case, when they load the degree plan, it's already have the selected course that they have indicated. Or, or they, they can make the choice in unit time. So I can say, okay, I need the mathematics 162. And they can see the list of the classes, their availability, times, instructors, or some details. There are also, these, these details are also linked from an external source. So I can make some choice. And the other thing that the degree planning tool, in our case, degree works as they are these placeholders that we don't actually get any information other than that, okay, the student need to get some, some written or oral communication course for three credits. So in this case, yeah, we just show that information when the student hits apply the course request table gets automatically populated with those choices and I need to find some communication course. I don't know whether this, this applies or not, but let's say it does. And at the end, I just hit the build schedule and I, I, well, I get a, a schedule, uh, one, one of the possibility of a schedule that this is the courses that I've indicated. I can see it uh, as a list or as a grid and I can start making modifications. Let's say I don't really like the 730, so I can click on it, on that section and I can see that it can be moved. Actually, this the first choice is just get a different section which is in a different room at the same time. Or there could be a Tuesday, Thursday at 11.30 instead of Tuesday, Thursday, 7.30. And as I, I browse the, the changes, I can see in a thumbnail or a mouse over window how the schedule would look like with these changes. And the system automatically computes up to 20 suggestions and they get more and more complicated as they come. So essentially what it does, it's for each possible time, it gives you one, one possible placement. It, yeah, it, it tries to minimize the, the number of other choices as well, or there are some selections which, okay, you, you can get an 830 Tuesday, Thursday, 830 class, but it means that you'll, you'll have to not have the the other the design or what was it the communication class because it's at the time and it does not have any other choice or the other choices are not available. They can also filter the court the the, the list of suggestions. Well, let me just pick some. Well, I've actually just swap it with something else. The other possibility I have is I can go back to course requests and provide some some more requirements. So I can say uh, 7 a.m. to 10 a.m. I want free. And let's say after 5.30. So I can either just type it in and it tries to pass the, the text and provide suggestions or I can select these times over here. And at this moment, I was already 
given a schedule, so it did not change anything. I just now see that there are some free times, but I can hit this rearrange schedule button, which forgot what I have has been given so far and just tries to give you give me a schedule that considers my 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 new requirements. And so I can see it's it's actually possible to get a schedule that does not have an early morning or yeah, I can start my classes at 10 30. And be done by by five thirty. The other thing I can do is I can add some additional course. So let's see what I can add. Communication. And they just select the course, and it will automatically give me some some choices where that course can can be placed and it could rearrange other stuff so that it fits in this case it just notifies me that it's overlapping with my monday tuesday wednesday thursday friday 7 30 to 10 a.m free time requirement and i guess i will have to deal with that i don't see to, don't seem to be more more choices yeah i can have some choices but i don't get the other class instead. Well, this one is actually quite nice. It doesn't work that well. And that, that would be also the, the, the case if I try to rearrange the schedule again. It will just shuffle everything, whereas the suggestions, it tries not to make them. And actually, in this case, it gave me more classes. It's a, it's a it's free time at the 7.30 to 10. It usually happens when it, it it tries to minimize other stuff as well. So sometimes, yeah, I would probably have to go go back in and move the, the, the free time higher in the list. Well, anyway, so that's with the scheduling assistant. And when, when I'm done, I just hit submit schedule. And that, that, that's my schedule. The free time is making it bigger. The other thing I, I can I can show you is making modifications to to courses. Let's see. Let's pick some course. Oh, I need to be in Spring. Where I'm playing. And this one looks nice. So, so we have a course which has two alternative lectures. So students can either take a lecture at 1 30, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, or at 8 30, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. So let's go in and move one of them. And we have currently both of them. Have limit 48 and one of them has 17 students and the other has 11 and I can actually if I open this I would be able to see the individual students so as I mentioned during the presentation I need to log the course which means that at this point no no more students can get in if, if a student wants to put to get into the course they will just end up on a wait list and the minute I unlock it they, they'll get in they can still drop the course, of course. So, which one? Well, that's not really matter. So, let's take second lecture and move it someplace else. I'm using the class assignment page, and I, here I can see. Okay, if I move it at, to Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Friday, nine thirty, there will be four student conflicts. Then certainly there will be six student conflict, so let's do that. And actually, it, it also shows me those those students. So there will be four four conflicts with with this class and some other class of ME two hundred. Uh, mm -hmm. I was just gonna say we have uh, less than five minutes. Okay, so just let me assign that class. Let 
I just picked some some room. So so now it, it still has 13 students here and 11 here, but the minute I unlock the course, it will process those students and move them around. So now I have 17 in, in the other section and only five in the one that I, that I have moved around and I've ended up with, with two students on a wait list. And if I look at that student, I can even open the scheduling assistant from here. I can see that yeah, that would have, I would have to move some other class to be for that student to be able to get in. So yeah, that's up to me to do that manually or up to the student. We don't really want to make too many modifications to student schedule. So that's the reason why we only change within the course, the, the, the schedule within the course that has to be modified. That's already being manipulated. So, okay, let's say uh, that's for the demo for now. So are there any questions? I can see one that Stephanie may have already answered. Does it update external SIS system after you make your schedule? Yes, currently what we do, the minute you, uh, with the Bender XE, the minute you hit the enroll button, So this is for that one student. So if I make a change, the minute I hit the sub, can you see the screen still? Yeah, we can still see it. Yeah, okay. So when you hit the submit schedule button, it will first check that the space is still available. And at that point, it will query banner through the student API, try to enroll the student in, in the banner in the SIS for those classes. If the SIS uh, if banner does not object, it will enroll them in unit time as well and return to the student. If the student, if uh, banner has uh, any issues like a prerequisite check or, or something else that the unit time does not really care about, it will return an error which is then shown to a student. It's also possible, and banner does that as well. Like if I'm enrolling for five courses and banner is fine with four and I have a problem with the fifth one, I'll get enrolled in the first four and then the fifth, I get a prerequisite or some other error from Banner. And it, it's it's visualized, it, it's shown in, in unit time and the students can take action, they can drop that course and try to add something else as they need. And we also, when the students are logging in, we also go in and ask Banner for their current schedule, check that unit time has the, the same information and also, there are eligibility checks on the banner side. For instance, the time windows, as I mentioned, they are there, they are set on, on, on the banner side. So if the banner says the student does not have a time window, we let them in, but they don't have the schedule, the submit schedule button because they don't have a time window. They cannot make modifications at the moment. And there is a like there is this this orange banner down here. There is a, a, another different orange banner saying you don't have a time window or some, that message that comes from banner when you don't have a time window essentially. Okay, is there, I hope I did answer that, that question. Yeah, thank you. You're welcome. Is there any other question? Well, it looks like there's probably not any other questions right now and uh, we just hit 1, 1 p.m. Eastern, so uh, might be mm -hmm. a good time to just wrap up and and uh, thank you very much for the presentation. Mm -hmm. Okay, I would just like to say that we have more, there are more details on our unitime.org website. We have an online demo available at demo.unitime.org and if you have any questions, you can tell, send us an email at support.unitime.org. Super, uh, thank you. And as I mentioned, uh, we this has been recorded, and so we'll uh, get it up on the Aperio uh, YouTube channel um, probably in the next uh, couple days. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Tomas. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye for now. I'm going to stop the recording. Bye. Mm -hmm.